Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you today about genetic identification of an isolated seahorse population on the island of Eleuthera. And when I first was invited to work on this project um, by my undergrad advisor, Dr. Mason Jones, who's speaking next, um, I really had no idea how, how amazing the experience would be working here in the Bahamas and all the uh, people that I would meet down here. So it's really been a fantastic experience and the project has been even more than I would have expected actually. So I want to introduce you a little bit to Sweeting's Pond, which is on the island of Eleuthera. So those of you who have never been there, this is a fantastic system. And the Bahamas offers a variety of ecosystems for us to study evolutionary mechanisms such as natural uh, variation, allows us to uh, study speciation, as well as local adaptation. So not only do we have these uh, grouping of islands, but we also have small ponds as well where these sites of speciation often occur. So Sweeting's Pond is a really great um, location to do your field work. Um, it's basically laying on the bottom of a beautiful pond with no large predators, and it's also littered with seahorses. So it really doesn't get much better for a field site. Um, so when you look here at the picture, these are typically what we're finding, these seahorses up here. Um, this is the southern end of the pond, okay, which is an old quarry site. Um, over here we have the north end of the pond, and this picture here shows you the ridge looking over the edge of the pond into the Caribbean side, so the west side of Eleuthera. And the interesting work that we found, the only work that was published prior to 2014 when we started this study, was research showing that um, populations of octopus and also brittle stars were showing really unique behaviors because they are acting very strange with no predators in the environment. They were moving around during the middle of the day, which is, as many of you know, is very strange for an octopus. And so when you move the predators, um, when there's no predators around, they, these animals were changing their behaviors. So to give you an idea of where we're working in the pond, anyone? Okay. Um, so Sweeting's Pond is about the center of Eleuthera. And so it's to the north a bit here. Okay. So what we have here is this pond, which to give you an idea of how big it is, it's about a mile long and half a mile wide. And the deepest depth is about 43 feet. Um, 13 meters. And we also have a unique population here. Um, this is Hatchet Bay, which is a similar type of pond. However, it has been opened um, and now it has access to the open ocean. So this is a really unique set of systems together to be able to study parallel evolution and things like that. So one of the interesting things was that when we found these population of seahorses, we immediately saw that there was a huge amount of variation. And so one of the things you'll notice is that if you look at all the pictures to your left, these are pictures of different seahorses from the pond, okay? And they all look very, very different. They all have an extreme phenotypic variation. Some of them have um, shorter snouts here. You can see a very short snout here. Some of them have longer snouts here, okay? So when we first started looking at the population, we really had no idea which of the two particular species that are located in the Bahamas we were actually looking at. So if you look here, just for those of you not familiar with seahorses, this on top is a male. He has a brooding pouch here. Okay, that's where the male carries the babies. And this is our female here. Um, we have two different species typically found in the Bahamas. So we have our reed eye here and also our erectus. So the reed eye are the long snout and slender seahorses. The erectus has more of a shorter stubby nose and a much broader head. So one of the things that we noticed was that we were really having a mix match of all these different traits on the different seahorses across the pond. So previous work in the 70s had said that reed eye, a hippocampus reed eye, was the population found in the pond. And so even though many of these do have the longer snout, typical of a reed eye, they did have a lot of traits that looked more similar to erectus. So we weren't quite sure what exactly we were looking at. So the question is, what species are we are we actually dealing with here? So the most important part of being able to do the conservation work and protecting this really unique population is first identifying the actual species we're looking at. And there's two ways you can do that. First with morphological traits, and the second is using genetics. And so we decided to take both approaches. So we know that hippocampus erectus and hippocampus redi are found both in the Bahamas. And we also know that even though they're separated by millions of years, of divergence time, and they're found on separate clades within the, within the genus of hippocampus, we do know that they readily hybridize in captivity. And so even though there's never been a hybrid found 
in natural populations, we know that they actually prefer to hybridize when they're in the lab setting. So what we wanted to basically identify was, do we have one of the two parental species that are known? Do we have a hybrid? Or do we have a new species on our hands? So the first thing that we did was we surveyed the pond in, uh, two summers ago, so 2014. And we were able to collect several different seahorses. And it's part of a much bigger and broader project, which will be the following talk. So you're going to hear a lot more about the actual diversity of these fish next. But for this project, we really needed to identify the species. So what we did was we took a small piece of their fin here. Okay, um, It's a really tiny amount. It's just enough to be able to do genetics with. And we know from previous studies that it doesn't affect their ability to swim around the pond. So we decided to use uh, morphometrics and as well as genetics. So here's an example of us on the pond. This is one of our fantastic interns um, from the Bahamas. And he, here he is helping me with the seahorses. Um, in, and we're basically uh, able to just take a fin clip, which should be on the next slide. Okay, So you can see here, I'm just taking a small piece of their fin. And here you can see this is with the piece removed. So it would typically stick out a little bit more here. This is what the fin typically looks like. So we're taking a small amount for genetics, as well as photographs on all of our transects to identify the morphology of these particular fish. OK, so here's how we do the morphometrics. This is very commonly done for all of the seahorse species. And mostly what you want to be able to do is identify the length of the snout relative to the length of their head, as well as the proportion of their torso to their tail. Okay? So we were able to use these morphometrics. Unfortunately, the traditional morphometrics that ichthyologists use for fish, including number of fin rays um, or bony plates, Unfortunately, these two species overlap in their ranges of fin rays. So that's not the typical thing we can use. So what we moved to was actually proportions of the body. So before you start looking at all the numbers on here, I just want to orient you to what we're looking at. So here we have our Sweetings Pond fish. Okay, and this is a larger sampling of our fish. Um, and the Florida Gulf Coast, we have Erectus, which are found off uh, Tampa Bay. Okay. Um, this is an uh, older sampling of Erectus, um, and we have that from the literature. We also have a Brazilian species um, of the reed eye that was provided by a collaborator. And lastly, there's a Brazilian species um, that is not found in the Bahamas that we wanted to use as an outgroup, basically. So what we did was, was we looked at all the different ratios along here. These are the ratios of snout to head length. We also looked at tail to trunk length. And what what you'll notice when you just glance across, basically, is that a lot of these columns have quite a bit of overlap. Okay? So we have ranges of 0.3 to 0.4. And over here, we also have that. So a lot of these traits were not all that informative. But we did, however, find one particular trait that we thought was fairly interesting. So if you notice down here, this is our Sweetings Pond group. Then we have the Erectus group and the reed eye. Okay? And what you're noticing here, hopefully, is that the tail-biased groups are the two parental species. And our group is much more evenly proportioned of their torso to their tail. So the one additional way to take all of the data that we took from morphometrics into consideration was to look at a discriminant analysis. So this actually used all five of our pieces of data, Okay, so all five morphometric analysis, uh, measurements. And what happened was we took reed eye, erectus, and our Sweetings Pond seahorses. And what we found was that they're all unique. So none of the groups overlapped. And 90% of the individuals were correctly classified into their group. So what you can see here is that we have um, our Sweetings Pond group here. We have the erectus here and the reed eye here. So they are uniquely different. And the morphometrics um, do tell us a little bit of information, but it doesn't tell us which species our Sweetings Pond belong to. We just know that they're all equally different. So what we did next was we turned to genetics. And for genetics, we decided to use one nuclear gene and one mitochondrial gene. Now, in typical seahorse research, we don't know the number of chromosomes. We're not exactly sure um, if sex determination in these fish. But one thing that we do know is that mitochondrial DNA is often very, very useful in identifying which species we're looking at here. So, the genetic sequencing, we um, actually did our extractions here in the Bahamas, our makeshift lab. Um, then we did all of our PCRs and our, DNA, um, our sequencing pre-steps, basically, at Texas A&M, where I'm finishing my dissertation. 
And then we sent the data off to Yale for sequencing. So once we got the data back, we were able to download the sequences for all of the other species we were interested in. So we have our reed eye parental species, we have our erectus parental species, as well as the outgroup that I mentioned from Brazil. So we used all of those, and here first is our cytochrome B. So hopefully you guys can uh, read it in the back, but if you can't, I'll um, group them for you. So the Bahamas samples are here, okay? So we only used the full-length sequences. I have several more individuals that sorted to the same groupings, but we made sure that we kept the full-length sequences on our, our phylogenetic trees. So what this basically is, is this is a maximum likelihood phylogenetic analysis that is sorting our groups into where they belong in different clades. So the way that you can tell if a clade is highly supportive, if all of the members belong to that clade, is by the branch support values here, okay? So bootstrap values were fairly high separating out this group here, okay? So what you're looking at here, if you guys can't read it, is this blue box here, okay, is supported by a bootstrap length of 99, okay? So it's very strong support showing that the read eye groups separately from the other two groups. We also have high support of 95 bootstrap values, separating our outgroup, the Patagonicus from Brazil. But interestingly, up here, our Bahamas fish are clearly coming out as part of Hippocampus erectus, okay? So even though the previous data had showed us that Hippocampus redi was thought to be in the pond using morphometrics um, in the 1980s, we now know from cytochrome B, from our mitochondrial DNA, that they are grouping with the erectus. Now, to make sure that there were no additional single nucleotide polymorphisms that belonged to the reed eye, we decided to use a nuclear gene as well. So this is our ribosomal gene S7, and what you can see here is, okay, hopefully you guys can see that. So we have our reed eye down here, okay, and the reed eye is really strongly supported as being separate. However, all of these other groups group together. So Patagonicus was originally thought to be a member of the erectus species, and they do fall out here within this erectus clade. And because of, um, because of a longer coalescence time with uh, ribosomal genes, we do see that they, gr they group together, even though mitochondrially they do show to be separate species, okay? So we do have our Bahamas group grouping separately here, okay? We have several single nucleotide polymorphisms that show that are unique to our po uh, Bahamas population that neither of the parental species have, However, it's not enough to show they're a unique species, okay? So this could be something that is evolving into a new species, but we're not there yet. They're definitely still within the clade of erectus. Okay, so the main conclusions for the talk are that the population that is found in Sweeting's Pond on Eleuthera is genetically classified as a hippocampus erectus. And so the unique thing is, though, that their morphology doesn't show them to be similar to Erectus or the other parental species, which is Hippocampus redi. Um, one of the other interesting things is that they have incredibly shorter tails compared to the other species. So the other species that we studied are found on coastal environments. There's really strong currents where these guys are found. And so one of the, there's several possibilities of why we have this happening. The first reason we could have smaller tails in our Sweeting's Pond population compared to all of the other seahorses that have been measured on the western Atlantic coast is potentially that there's just a lot of um, phenotypic variation in this population. The other potential is that the original founding population that began in the pond started with smaller tails. And the other possibility is something that over several generations of being in a pond with no current they slowly evolved smaller tails over several generations. So there's three different hypotheses, and we're going to have to do quite a bit more work to identify what the real reasoning behind this unique morpho morphology is. Okay? The other thing that we're going to be talking about in the next talk is the amount of variation there is on these fish, which is really exciting because the phenotypic plasticity of these groups is uh, something you don't often see. So one other thing to mention, though, is that, as I said earlier, this is a predator-free environment. So by not having large predators in the pond, we have the potential for unique selection pressures to no longer be acting on these seahorses. So there could typically be pressures that are acting on the seahorses from predators, okay, whereas we no longer have that. So we could have different type of flashy morph uh, morphological characteristics on these fish that slowly evolve because they're not as, uh, they're not as concerned under the selection pressure of predators. 
So we know for sure, though, just in case you're curious, we have tested this hypothesis um, that was originally brought about in the 80s of having no predators in the pond. So we've done several um, remote uh, videos. And so we bait, basically, this is just fish bait right here. And we set up the cameras so that anything in the pond will find. So the largest fish in the pond are a small group of groupers that we've seen in the pond. Um, and that's about it. So the way that this pond is, um, has been studied so far is that we've done several transects along the north end and the southern end of the pond. So the next step on this project is actually to identify the amount of variation in the pond and be able to tell how much genetic diversity we have in the pond. OK. So we already have all of our samples collected for this part of the analysis. And the next part of the analysis will involve using microsatellite data and also single nucleotide polymorphisms. Because what this will allow us to do is determine how much genetic distance the, the seahorses in the north of the pond have from the south of the pond. And this may also tease apart some of the variation that we're seeing in the morphology. So we're going to be using this, um, all of the samples from the pond to look at the pond variation. But what we're really, really interested in, actually, is by identifying how the seahorses from Sweeting's Pond are different from the potential seahorses outside of the pond, whether they're in Hatchet Bay, okay, which is actually open to the ocean, or even along this coastline. So we know that this is an area that has similar habitat. We've done a lot of surveying. And so we're really excited because last week we were actually given information that seahorses were sighted in Hatchet Bay. And so if you guys have any information, we would love to hear from you. And with that, I need to thank my collaborators. So we have to thank our group at um, the Leon Levy Preserve for all of their help. And also our CEI folks, um, uh, Jocelyn, who's also been really important in this project as well. So with that, I'd like to thank my funding. And I don't have any time for questions, so I apologize.